I remember so long ago when the virtues of storytelling and spoken word art, uh, for lack of a better word, um, was a, a real fringe operation at NPR. People like uh, Joe Richmond and uh, Ira Glass and other would-be and future storytellers uh, worked in the trenches. And I also spent a lot of time at the original TED conferences in Monterey, where they were a celebration of what was going on in the valley, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and they were run by a, a wonderful fellow from uh, Newport, Rhode Island, by the name of Richard Saul Werman, an architect and designer, who ran the TED conferences, the original TED conferences, kind of like a Catskills, uh, Borscht Belt uh, kind of comedy routine. It, it, was, it was his vision that he just wanted people to come up and tell him what the heck was going on in the world uh, in terms of the digital revolution and all the technological changes that were taking place. And the original TED conferences were, were you know, five speakers who would come up and announce new gadgets and then maybe one or two speakers who were associated with one of the big startup tech companies like Adobe would come up and, and share their collection of you know, rare books or something like that. Um, and, and there was very little inspiration, but it was a community, and it was a community dedicated to figuring out what, what is change. Well, these, these communities of public broadcasting and the idea of storytelling as a means for underscoring our connections in the world and reminding us all that uh, there are stories that reside in each of us that connect us together um, has been the great and um, really wonderful surprise of my career in journalism. As someone who at age 19 was in a car that was driving on a road in Pennsylvania and uh, while I fell asleep in the back seat, the driver fell asleep in the front seat uh, and went over a 200-foot ravine, and uh, uh, I was the only survivor of uh, that accident, and um, I was quite grateful to be able to get around in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, but I became something of the other, and uh, what I learned is being different in the United States can be a very difficult and um, painful narrative. Um, particularly when you are raised in the upstate suburbs of Binghamton, New York, and think of yourself as just part of the party here in the United States. Um, it's so easy for us to say things like, this is the greatest country in the world, or we're going to make America great again, and uh, America's already great, stop saying we're going to make it great again, and, and have these discussions that, that just don't really resonate when you get right down to the community level, and you see what it is that binds us and what it is that, that makes us uh, a community which, writ large, is America. Um, I don't know if you paid attention to the uh, news from Georgetown University about two weeks ago where Georgetown announced that because of a transaction where slaves were sold at auction in uh, the 1830s, that uh, it was calculable that the university benefited from that transaction in a, in a way that translated into 2016 dollars was something that they could subtract from their endowment and use to compensate individuals who were still alive, who were uh, uh, descended from those slaves, and to make a preference for those individuals who received no, of course, benefit from slavery, how could you, um, who may or may not have known about this transaction, although it was well known uh, by the Georgetown community for about 12 years before they made this decision. Uh, and I thought, well, that's a, that's a decent workaround uh, for uh, the Holocaust of slavery. And and as someone who, who was raised in the United States during the era of the Vietnam War and where, where you just really couldn't resolve the question of are we the greatest country on earth or 
Are we a nation built on slave labor and ethnic cleansing? What, what, what is this country called America? How am I related to this history? What is my responsibility to this history? And what is my connection to the people who are viewed either as the other or who I somehow can't reach in my day-to-day -day life or in the language that we speak of? In America, if you look at the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act and, and, and you look at uh, the Bill of Rights and uh, the preamble to the Declaration of Independence, and, and you see that all men are created equal and, and let's not have any discrimination on the basis of gender and race and ethnicity. And um, oh, by the way, let's not deprive anyone of life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness without due process of law. I mean, if you look at the language of those documents and, and the Civil Rights Act, which says uh, services will be delivered without discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, or uh, disability, um, you wonder as a, as a young child, you know, now why would they have to keep saying that over and over again? I mean, didn't they say it once? All men are created equal. Um, why would they have to reiterate this again and again and again? And this is the great frustration that we live in America in the 21st century right now because there is a sense of work undone, a sense of, a sense of why is racism still here? What, why is intolerance still a part of our communities? Why is America more segregated today than it was in 1960? Why is education in America more segregated today than it was in the 50s when Brown versus Board of Education was passed? How can this be possible? Well, it's because what we've addressed in these legalistic changes that are revolutionary, that emancipated slaves, that eliminated the uh, Jim Crow laws, that, that made it um, a crime to discriminate, um, that made it a felony, in fact, to put people in concentration camps uh, during World War II, unless they were Japanese, and oh, that was just a mistake, but don't worry about that. Um, we said we were sorry. Uh, that we don't really in America address the real circumstances and history of why all of us are here, which is probably why the discussion over immigration is so difficult to have right now and involves walls and, and uh, vetting and uh, uh, the language that we hear from uh, the candidates and, and the great frustration that we have about immigrants as though they are hordes of people trying to get into the United States to hurt us, to kill us. And this is a ritual in American life now, um, this idea that security is uncertain because of the sense of the other coming to get something that we have. Georgetown has made a decision that says these questions are knowable. And if they are knowable, could we have those conversations? And could I say, you know, I would actually, I would actually pay a tax if it was going to mean that we had a conversation about this slavery issue, this, this if we're talking about native uh, peoples, the first people in the United States, if we're talking about what happened to the people who used to live here before European contact. If we were having that conversation and I paid a tax that became some fund to share and not fully compensate, because that's impossible, but to at least achieve some form of reconciliation, explicit reconciliation, what a joy that would be. And no longer would I have to get on the subway and, and look at everybody who's like, you know, staring. Just don't make eye contact. New York is a wonderfully diverse place to live, but we are separated by this sense that there are subjects we can't or shouldn't or don't have the tools to bring up. I've spent a lot of time living around the world. Um, I spent a lot of time living in Jerusalem where there were bombs every week. And people would get on the phone, make sure they were 
safe, that their loved ones were safe, and uh, individuals who randomly on a bus in a shopping area found themselves in the line of fire and died. Jews, Palestinians, in Cairo it was the same, suicide bombs, things that, that terrified individuals living everywhere. And over the course of my journalistic career, I asked myself, what, what is it that these bombs hurt? What, what is it that they're getting at? What is it that they threaten? Because the bomb just wrecked some parking signs. It killed some people, of course. Knocked over a bus. I mean, this isn't like the tanks coming across the Warsaw Pact line, you know, uh, in the World War II. This isn't like traditional warfare. What is it that these bombs attack? In Somalia, I remember a, uh, an aid station where the bodies were stacked up higher than I could, than I could see. Um, and in my wheelchair, I would roll around and see these thin, thin, terribly famished and malnourished people who had died of starvation in the early 90s when I spent a lot of time in Somalia. And in the course of my visit to Somalia, what was striking was you'd go to one village and everyone was dying, and then you'd go to the next village and people were perfectly well fed. And you would ask the people in one village why it was like this, and they would say, don't ask, don't ask such a question. Well, why don't you help the people in the next village by sharing some of your food? And have us end up like the skeleton people, they would say? My God. And I really didn't have an option of saying, shame on you for not being malnourished and starving. I mean, it wasn't exactly a, a right I had. I was an outsider. I was parachuted in, and I would be, you know, flown out. But uh, in fact, it was these connections that Somalia, once a perfectly legitimate nation with a real government and a, a, a legislature, um, got caught in the pincer jaws of the Cold War, was a Soviet proxy for a while, and then an American proxy for a while, and by the time it was all over, the Somalia was run by warlords, it was called a rogue nation, now it's called a failed state. And in the early 90s, it was a failed state, and it still is a failed state today. I was in Mogadishu, and uh, I remember meeting some young boys who pretty much ran the show in Somalia. Um, they would get up in the morning and eat this stuff called cot, which was like cocaine, which made them all very high and um, uh, nervous. And since they all carried AK-47s, high and nervous young boys doing cocaine around you wasn't exactly the definition of a security patrol. Or These aren't the people you would want at a baseball game running security, for instance. But that was what they had in Somalia. And the boys reported to the warlords, and the warlords ran particular neighborhoods in Mogadishu. And I remember visiting one neighborhood. And, and uh, while our television crew was off shooting pictures of some terrible damage in Mogadishu, um, I was playing with these two young boys and their AK-47s and just trying to make friends. And uh, we had our own security team with us, but I was just with the translator at this moment. And they were very curious about my wheelchair and what the hell I was doing there and why the hell anyone in a wheelchair would want to come to Mogadishu, who looked like they were from upstate Binghamton, New York, not that the Somalis had any understanding of what Binghamton was. Um, so I did some tricks. I you know, did a wheelie and rolled up and down the street, and, and uh, uh, they thought that was funny, and it seemed like we were bonding, and, and all of a sudden the translator said to me, let's get out of here, and I said, why, why, this is, this is going great, and uh, he said, no, no, we, we have to go, and we went back to the place where the crew was and where our security detail was and where our vehicles were parked, and, and he said, the boys were looking at your wheelchair and speaking of someone that they knew who had been injured 
in an explosion who could no longer walk. And they wondered why you had this chair and he didn't have any chair at all. You have this idea that, oh gosh, there's a war and then people will just rebuild. And somehow it's this linear kind of movement from, from war to peace, from chaos to rebuilding. And it doesn't actually work that way. Um, in fact, once the, the gossamer threads that connect us together, that make us communities, are destroyed, and the boys are running around with AK-47s, and there is no structure to anything in life, you're back in the Stone Age. There's no, there's no recovery from that. There's no natural recovery from that. You can't just deliver food to communities like that who have lost those sense of threads and connections. And I think it's these connections, this idea that it's knowable, our historical connection. It's knowable, and if it's knowable, then we can talk about what our relationship is to each other. And it's not racist to understand that a group of people will retain disadvantages from being enslaved or displaced, and that privilege is perceived as a weapon in a country where there are so many serious inequalities. And so I'm not paying much attention to the national election, but I am spending a lot of time focused on the connections that we have amongst us here in communities like this. And when I get on the subway, I look around and I say, I could talk to that person. I could just talk to that person. We should just have a conversation. And uh, I've actually been doing this quite a lot and my girls go with me on the subway. And I always say before we get out of the car, Daddy, you're not gonna, one of those, I mean, are you, really? Are you, I might. And I do. And when we get off, I say to them, yeah, that wasn't so bad, was it? No, but I just didn't know where you were going with that. <laughs> and that's it. We don't know where we're going with that. But let's get there as fast as we can. Thank you very much.